introduction. Um, hi, I'm Leonis Pausch. I'm uh, president of Holland Politics, and it's really an honor to welcome you today, uh, Jan. You are former Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, over the past four decades, uh, Jan has emerged as a prominent figure in the world of diplomacy, playing a vital role in resolving conflicts and addressing humanitarian crises on a global scale. From the Middle East to the Balkans, from the Caucasus to East Africa and numerous other regions in the world, his contributions have left an indelible mark. Whenever and wherever conflict has arisen, he stepped up the challenge and showed exceptional skills and leadership. Mr. Eliasson has not only served his native Sweden with distinction in the United Nations, but has also represented his country as ambassador to the United States between 2000 and 2005 and as foreign minister in 2006. In more recent years, he was governing board chair of Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, one of the leading think tanks on peace and international relations globally. At a time marked by complex and ever-changing global landscape, um, with China and America's role uncertain, uh, we welcome here and are very fortunate to uh, accept uh, that Jan Eliasson accepted our invitation to share his insights on how to promote peace and cooperation in an ever more polarized world. I eagerly anticipate Mr. Elias, Mr. Eliasson thoughts and look forward to our welcoming conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elias, for this uh, introduction. Uh, it was a reminder of my age. Uh, <laughs> And I, very good to meet you. Uh, you are the ones who are going to run with the baton in this uh, race we have for peace, development, and human rights in the world. It's an uphill battle, so I'm glad you are preparing yourselves uh, as carefully as possible. Uh, if you trust me, I, I trust you indeed in this, and I'm very glad to join you to talk about uh, some of my, my work, which has involved mediation and negotiation uh, very much. I've been mediating in six different wars and conflicts and uh, numerous humanitarian corridor situations when I was responsible for the humanitarian affairs of the UN uh, in the 90s. I thought I would give an introduction of 10 to 15 minutes and then I leave it to you to ask questions and make comments uh, on the subjects that I've mentioned and also the subjects that I have not mentioned. To begin with, uh, I think uh, we have to admit that uh, today's situation is more uncertain and I would even say more dangerous uh, than it has been for a long time. Uh, I thought for a while we had enough, of course, with the Ukraine war and then suddenly we saw this nightmare erupt in the Middle East and uh, with consequences uh, that are of the same character, a serious character as the Ukraine crisis. So we have two major crises at hand. And uh, the sad thing for me to admit is that uh, there is very little room for diplomacy in both of these situations. In the Ukraine case, uh, the uh, positions from the Russians and the uh, Ukrainians are so far apart that there's really no basis for negotiation. And uh, the parties are not ready for negotiation anyway. In order to reach any result in mediation, you have to have a political will to reach some type of uh, compromise. But in the case of uh, Ukraine, they cannot imagine uh, the uh, fact that aggression should be rewarded and territory should be gained by military force. I'll leave that aside for possible discussion later on. To the Middle East, uh, unfortunately, we have the same situation. Diplomacy is uh, not visible. There might be talks going on right now, this moment, on uh, the humanitarian uh, ceasefire, which the Israelis and the Americans prefer to call humanitarian pause or pauses in plural. Um, the uh, speculation is that there could be uh, some type of opening uh, to open up uh, Gaza, which is suffering. The population is of course suffering tremendously from the siege that actually exists. And there's the possible, there is a possibility that there may be some type of discussion of a deal. Uh, on the one hand, uh, um, the humanitarian ceasefire or pauses, and on the other hand, a, a number of uh, hostages, maybe older people or young people. We'll see whether that speculation is true 
uh, evidently the US and Egypt and possibly uh, possibly um, Qatar are involved in those talks, which are was very secret. Uh, the rumors uh, of a solution in that regard or a step forward are denied by Israel uh, recently, just a couple of hours ago. But I just this this I mentioned this only to make the point that diplomacy uh, is not around in the major uh, cases of war and conflict today. There is, in general, I would say, a deficit in diplomacy in international politics right now. Uh, most conflicts are raging uh, with the uh, illusion that uh, the, the conflicts will be solved by military means. You see it in Ukraine, you see it in uh, Gaza, Kamas uh, confrontation. You see it in a number of other areas, in Myanmar and in Sudan, which is uh, suffering tremendously from two military factions being uh, at war with each other. And all this, of course, is for me to make the point uh, in the beginning that, unfortunately, United Nations uh, is in the back seat, or if in the car at all. Uh, I have rarely seen the UN so... Uh, outside the uh, main uh, theater as they are now. Uh, the veto in the Security Council is notorious. Uh, it has been for a long time. When I was Deputy Secretary General, it was a Syria war that uh, immobilized the Security Council. Now it is uh, this, the uh, Ukraine war and the Middle East situation where you clearly will have a confrontation uh, in the Security Council from one side or the other. So that means that we will not have any meaningful resolutions from the Security Council. Um, the UN role is mostly limited to humanitarian uh, assistance. Uh, you should know, to give you an impression of the sacrifices on all sides, particularly now in Gaza, that US UN has lost 99 people as of this morning. Uh, people who have families in the uh, Gaza area, uh, almost 100, that is, uh, dying, uh, trying to uh, make people survive, helping them move from the north to the south. Uh, I have friends uh, in the UN who have called me and given me names of people whom I know from my earlier work at the UN. So the question then is whether the UN could uh, move the... Uh, initiative in the political area from the Security Council to other places. That is not easy. Uh, I think, though, that there is probably room for improvement in terms of what the General Assembly can do. You may know, those of you who are studied, studying for diplomatic postings later on, <laughs> that uh, there is something called Uniting for Peace. The Korean War and the US UN operation back in those days was actually uh, decided by this formula in the General Assembly. I think uh, the member states should recall that when the Security Council is immobilized, as they are now, the uh, General Assembly should uh, reflect the will of the international community and uh, take a stronger role in conflicts as of today. The other possibility is, of course, that the Secretary General uh, uses his uh, role, his uh, uh, command post um, uh, to uh, uh, make the cases based on international law. And here I would like to just pick up the charter that I have in my study here and uh, read to you uh, Article 99. Now, this is for the experts here. Article 99 actually gives the Secretary General the right of initiative in the Security Council because it says in this Article 99, and my, my message is, of course, that this could and should be used more often. The Secretary General may bring to the attention of the Security Council any matter which, in his opinion, I hope her in the future, opinion may threaten the maintenance of international peace and security. In other words, he could bring up any issue ask foreign ministers to come in from the 15 nations and present proposals, uh, which could influence public opinion at least, uh, but also maybe uh, the legislative bodies and, uh, uh, and other political actors on the world scene. 
So uh, then the other part that I should mention for the UN is, of course, that uh, the UN agencies exist. If I look back at my 10, 12 years or so at the UN, uh, my proudest moments and my greatest pride lies with the uh, work in the field by organizations like UNHCR, UNICEF, uh, World Food Programme, those that are out there in the field who make life uh, make people survive under the most dire circumstances. So I don't give up on the UN, although I, as you hear, I am rather uh, pessimistic about the present uh, situation. My last point is to tell you that my experience uh, and my specialty in the UN has been uh, conflict resolution and mediation. I have studied it also. I was visiting professor at Uppsala University together with one of the greatest experts on peace resolution, namely P Professor Peter Wallenstein, a person that you should, whose writing you should pursue, in my view. I was there for a year and came back another year after I finished as foreign minister of Sweden. And then, of course, earlier I have these negotiations on uh, after the wars ending. Uh, in Iran, Iraq, Darfur, and Nagorno-Karabakh has been the three wars that I've been involved in, but also in, in, I would say, almost innumerable humanitarian situations and conducted diplomat, what I was called humanitarian diplomacy. When you establish a humanitarian corridor, it usually have, has not only human consequences, but also political consequences. And I will just give you the four reasons why you fail or succeed in negotiation. Sometimes I wish that I wrote my memoirs in English, but I didn't. I finished my memoirs last year. And there is a chapter which has become very popular at the universities. It is called The Reasons Why You Fail or, or Succeed in Negotiation and Mediation. Uh, maybe you could get a Google translation of my book, <laughs> that chapter. Because the four reasons that are after my careful study of my own failures and successes, is that the four reasons to fail or succeed are, one, the words you use. You are in a very, very favored position since English is the lingua franca, if you allow the expression, in diplomacy. And uh, each of you should know six synonyms of encourage or whatever. Uh, and that is a tremendous strength to have those words like tools in your toolbox. Second reason to fail or succeed is timing. It is something that is not sufficiently analyzed. The timing of a proposal, the timing of an idea is crucial and should be analyzed much more careful than it is. Sometimes you do things too late, as you notice in your life, perhaps also the personal front. Uh, but very often I have seen examples of doing things too early. So timing must be analyzed in a mediation situation. Third reason to fail or succeed is sens cultural sensitivity or lack of it, I would say, for their failures. To know more about the parties, about their culture, their history, their traditions, the personal background of the chief negotiator, the clans, the, the tribes, etc. Uh, the geography, the churches, the synagogues, the mosques, whatever. All that is constituting uh, trust-building material. I don't mention that uh, in sort of manipulative purpose. Uh, it is actually, for you, much more interesting and fun, I would say, if you also, when you do this kind of work, know more about the culture and the situation of the parties to a negotiation. The fourth, I was about to say the last reason, but the fourth reason is personal relations and personality. In the end, it's always the question of a person who has to decide whether he or she can decide to go for a peaceful proposal, a compromise. Often that is associated with both uh, political and even physical risks in some of the negotiations that I've been involved. And in those situations, you have to trust the negotiator. You have to trust the mediator, which means that you must never lie. You must never be careful, careless with, with truth. And you must be exact in your wordings and your, your, uh, your description of the other party's uh, positions. If you, for instance, do 
uh, shuttle diplomacy, as I did in the Iran-Iraq war. They have to know that they trust the messages that you convey to the other party. These are the four reasons to fail or succeed. And I think uh, I could give you numerous examples of uh, situations where these four factors have played a role, but I'll leave that to the discussion if you're interested. And uh, leave it now to you to ask the questions that you find interesting or appropriate or whatever, even inappropriate, if you like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Um, building up on what you said uh, and the precarious state of diplomacy, um, how can one make diplomacy still engaging, still exciting for the younger generation? Um, is it easier or difficult, more difficult to become a diplomat between uh, now in 2023 than in 1960, as you, you were? Well, on the surface, uh, you will you will see that uh, it's more difficult to play a role. Um, those who ask for a peaceful uh, solution to the Ukraine problems uh, are even faced with uh, defeatist uh, charges. You know that you 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 leave uh, part of the territory to Russia if you have a ceasefire now, which is a valid comment. Uh, and I'm I'm very sorry that. Uh, you have played a, that the the military solutions have become the primary method to to solve. I hope you saw the quotation marks. I think diplomacy is important uh, because uh, more important than ever, in fact, and we must never give up diplomacy because the most urgent issue to look into is to find practical ways of doing prevention. You should. Uh, uh, if I look back at my whole life in diplomacy, I'm almost fr frustrated and angry and disappointed that we have allowed conflicts to fester and become wars in the end, which then become like letting the genie out of the bottle that gets out there, but it's very hard to get it back. And I think diplomacy should be identifying those vibrations in the ground early on whether it is you know human rights that are violated or extreme poverty that could lead to conflict or political problems that are not being dealt with or whatever and i think the security council has failed to work in a more preventive manner and i think this is the only way forward because we can't afford to have these horrible wars going on you mentioned that i was chairman of cipris stockholm international peace research institute and I will just give you the latest figures for military expenditure uh, last year was uh, now hold on to your chairs and try to see the numbers of zeros here. It's 2000, the yearly military expenditure today in the world is $2,240 billion per year. $2,240 billion per year. U.S. takes care of 45% 40, of that. China climbs up the ladder in a strange, in, in a rather clear way. And Russia comes third, I think. And France and others come down. And uh, what has happened is, of course, that you have seen a change of priorities. I was negotiating the Sustainable Development Goals uh, between 2012 and 2015. It's one of my proudest moments when those SDGs were finalized, uh, the 17 goals, uh, 2015, and especially when it was followed by the climate agreement in Paris in December, 2015. But what happened? The pandemic, the COVID-19 uh, hit the world and stopped the uh, progress on achieving these goals for two and a half years, maybe three years. And after it was finally under control or relative control, what happened? Well, Ukraine war broke out, and it's now one and a half year of war. And then comes this Middle East conflict. So development and even human rights are now in the background, while peace is searched for rather in a rather futile manner. No, no, I would say on the contrary. Uh, in this situation, I think the, we have to prepare ourselves to, to make sure that we don't have these uh, horrible nightmares going on. And I also think... I also think you should combine the efforts of peace with the efforts of development and the efforts of human rights. 
Uh, when I was president of the General Assembly, as you mentioned, 2005 and six, Kofi Annan and I sat down and uh, we, we, we asked the team to provide us with one sentence that summarized the work of the UN. And not only the UN, I would say also a nation. Uh, and it is uh, the following formula. There is no peace without development. But there is no development without peace. And there is no development and no peace without respect of human rights. You have three pillars, three legs on which security is built. And if one of these legs, these pillars is weak, the whole structure is weak. And they have to be pursued simultaneously. And that is a more modern way of looking at diplomacy. As CIPRI, as chair, I was very proud that we, when Sweden was in the Security Council, provided assistance to the government in their seat uh, in the Security Council to make sure that climate change, the climate crisis, is also seen as a security problem. You can imagine what happened when you live in 50 degrees Celsius or when you have a 40-year drought or you have floods taking over a third of your country and so forth. It will have also security implications and not speak about water. The fight and struggle for water could also turn into conflict. So I think you should have a, a, hope, a, a, a view on diplomacy as right now, not in the market in a sad and strange and dangerous way, but it will be absolutely necessary. When you look over the ruins in Ukraine and look over the ruins in Gaza and even parts of Israel, you will then say, where is diplomacy? And that's where you come in with your answers. Where's diplomacy? Uh, indeed. Um, maybe following up on that, has it become more easy for states to uh, not search for the diplomatic uh, solutions, but now use military actions? Or was there ever also a time in history where one can say military conflict was generally off the table? Well, I can tell you since I was a diplomat and during much of the uh, Cold War time that in those days you had more uh, clarity about the problems and you had more channels to communicate even with the other side on war and peace issues. When Russia made this horrible aggression in Ukraine, it wasn't only in breach of international law as defined in the UN Charter, it was also breaking down the security structure in Europe that was built over during the Cold War with confidence building measures and the Organization for Security and uh, Cooperation in Europe, OSCE and so forth, it was a network of uh, uh, measures that was based on, uh, on agreements and based on international law, and that is now gone. So you, you, you are in a situation where you more or less have to build from scratch there has to be some type of uh, new security structure being developed in Europe. I'm sorry to tell you that uh, we were extremely disappointed that UK uh, left, uh, left the uh, European Union because you, by that European Union was weakened tremendously. But I believe very much that the European Union will have a very important role to play in the future, hopefully with some type of stronger attachment again by United Kingdom and uh, Great Britain, I should say, perhaps. Um, and uh, I think this is important also for another reason, because I think the biggest problems are today the conflicts that I mentioned and the climate crisis. But to me personally, uh, growingly, I find that we have a huge challenge in standing up for democracy and uh, preserving and improving democracy. I think we are in deeper problems than we realize. And I think Europe then has a very important role to stand by the principles of democracy in a world where you have totalitarian rule and in uh, Russia and China, where you see uh, the strangest ever candidate 
uh, in the U.S. political history, having a good chance to be the president of the United States, and by that endangering, in my view, both democracy and uh, NATO co NATO cohesion, with his views of not wanting to uh, support Ukraine, as you know, which is rather serious for the whole organization of NATO and the relationship to, to the transatlantic relationship. So uh, I think we have a uh, we have a situation now the next decades which will be formative. We may choose the way of confrontation and uh, polarization and uh, military so-called solutions. But my God, what a world will we have? And uh, with complete neglect of the uh, development uh, problems, the uh, north-south issues, the uh, climate issues, and the human rights, and so forth. So um, I think this is uh, uh, we are at a uh, at a very important point of history where I think uh, the uncertainty of today uh, has to be uh, sort of replaced by thinking on reviving a security structure which is uh, based on uh, principles that I think are laid down very well in the UN Charter, but also it has a, an element of a good security structure for Europe. I'll just leave you as an example. What kind of role will Russia have in the future, whatever result of the war we will have? And um, what will be the reaction of Europe if there is a Trump victory? What? How will that help our cohesion and our attachment to democratic values? This is slightly speculative, I know, but I just want to leave that with you. Well, maybe maybe keep with Biden for a second in his uh, 2022 uh, during the assembly uh, uh, speech. He was saying he wanted to reform the United Security Council, uh, adding new non-core members, etc. But since 1963, there was no position to the UN Charter, to my uh, to my opinion, uh, to my knowledge. Um, do you see any future for substantial UN reform that can actually, yeah, help rebuild uh, a, a security system in the United uh, Nations Security Council? Well, the the the, the most important reform to come about, uh, which has been discussed forever and ever is the uh, veto power. Um, I met a countryman of yours, uh, most of you are British, I guess, English, British, uh, Sir Brian Urquhart, who, who was a leg legendary uh, UN official. He was uh, my mentor, but I was UN ambassador. And uh, I asked him, why did, you, why did you bring in this veto power? Because the, by that you go, you leave the principle of the equal value of every nation. Well, he said uh, there was a lesson we drew from the League of Nations that they didn't give uh, a damn about. That's the expression he used. They give they didn't give a damn about the uh, situation, let's say in Abyssinia, Ethiopia, or whatever for the Germans uh, and the Italians. No, the, the with the Italians uh, and uh, Germany was in uh, Spain, uh, and uh, now we wanted the Security Council, to, the UN, to be. Uh, an organization where the major powers took part <clears throat> and took and accepted responsibility. But in my view, they haven't lived up to that responsibility. It has been used to uh, prohibit uh, solutions uh, in several conflicts. And I think the Security Council has failed to act preventively, as I said, uh, and also used the threat of the veto to uh, stop action, which has hurt the reputation and still today, of course, very much hurts the UN. Um, I, I, I must tell you a joke that I uh, that I tried on the P5, the permanent five, when I left as PGA, President General Assembly. Uh, I said to them that you are not negotiating. Uh, you, you, you should negotiate resolutions. That's what we diplomats are supposed to do. And you just uh, launch your veto or your threat of the veto. And by that, you uh, immobilize the Security Council and gives it a bad reputation. You should sit down and negotiate. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I said, you should work like the Catholic Church when they choose popes, when they elect popes. They lock up the cardinals in the Sistine Chapel. And only when the white smoke comes up have they done their job. Then they can get out. 
<laughs> I think they should sit down and negotiate. We could have found solutions for the Syria war, for instance, if there had been such work done. Uh, and I've seen several examples where it should be done now, like, like, for instance, the situation in Sudan or Yemen, where there is really no national interest that stop action. But in the meantime, you have to live with this. It's hard. I think the Americans particularly are feeling pressure now from India and Brazil and, uh, and uh, Japan, uh, Germany less so today. Uh, but I think this pressure is on there. But I think in the meantime, we should work for other types of uh, reform. Uh, I believe that in today's world, you cannot work in silos. I think the UN and the international organizations alone cannot really play the role that we want them to do. You have to have a way of putting the problem in the center, the issues in the center post-Ukraine development, clean water, uh, human rights. You know, put, you put the problem in the center and then you involve all other actors that could, can, can influence the problem, which means that you engage governments, parliaments, civil society, the business sector, the academic world, the media, social media. You sort of get a sort of consolidation of influence on the real problem, putting the problem in the center, not bureaucracy, not the organization. So I, when I was Deputy Secretary General, I worked very much to open up the UN to all these other actors outside and bring them in, in the decision-making. And uh, if you look at the climate issues, how, they, how can that be solved if you don't engage all these actors that I just mentioned? But it goes for so many areas. And by that, you also get more of a popular engagement. And you get an investment in popular action. You can't be seeing diplomacy as some type of activities with gray-striped suits and, and people, you know, in the, in the uh, um, corridors having meetings and uh, having champagne receptions and so forth. It's a hard work, and it has to be involved involving all the actors that, that can influence the problems. So that is the kind of reform that I see. And also this, what I said earlier about combining efforts of peace uh, and security, development and human rights, and do it at the same time, so that they are mutually reinforcing. And then I'm proud of the uh, 17 goals. The Sustainable Development Goals is actually the toolbox to uh, reach the uh, Paris Agreement. The Paris Climate Agreement does not have a plan of action. The plan of action is the Sustainable Development Goals. If you achieve these goals, and particularly if you go through the targets below them, it's a to-do list to repair the world. It's a survival kit for humanity. And it was negotiated by 192 nations and accepted fully. And uh, even Trump's USA didn't leave that agreement. But unfortunately, realities made it more difficult to fulfill those goals. I mentioned earlier, pandemic, Ukraine, and now Middle East. Yeah, so the role of the Secretary General, you already mentioned uh, that the states, um, well, like the UN, uh, UN Security Council is not at the center of things. One should look at alternatives, United for Peace, uh, but also the Secretary General use of uh, Article 99. Uh, Antonio Guterres just introduced, I think last year, new, the new agenda for peace, which uh, also mentioned the problem of, um, and I quote, the deep sense of unease that grows among people, governments and international organizations are failing to deliver uh, to deliver for them. So it seems there is a disconnect between what the UN is dealing with countries, but they're dealing not with their population. Um, do you see that true? Could you repeat the last sentence? It it was lost in, in translation or yeah. communication here. So uh, Antonio Guterres said there was a deep drift, basically, between governments, governments yeah. and international organizations and the people. Um, yeah. Do you think the UN is part of that problem? And what did you do to sort of, you know, bridge that gap? Uh, it's a good question. It's a very good question, because what I, I want to claim is that what is characterizing today's world 
is not only this deep distrust between the nations, particularly the, the major powers. Uh, it has been it hasn't been this bad serious uh, for so long. If you look at the relationship between U.S. and China and Russia, for instance, and Europe, which doesn't have, play the role that I think Europe should play geopolitically, but I I also think that there is a mistrust inside nations growing. Uh, it is a, an international phenomenon right now that. Uh, there is an internal mistrust uh, to a degree that I haven't seen earlier. And not only sort of political discontent, miscontent, which is, you know, standard feature of democracies of fighting for power, but it's a, it's a deeper movement, uh, a polarization that goes to extremes. And where in our case, United States and Europe, it really touches the core of democracy. I don't know what this is, but, but there is a, a demand from people, which I understand, to see results from uh, the a government and from international organizations. So this, and this, if, if this mistrust is there and you don't see results, then people turn to extreme positions, mostly to the far right, in my view, more, that I find more dangerous. And where you distance yourself from classical democracy. You have seen it in the United States, you see it in some countries in Europe. And uh, I think, therefore, the word accountability is very important. The reason I'm so concerned about the UN right now, Security Council, is that if people give up on the UN, I mean, well, where do they turn? Well, they turn to their military leaders to solve their problems. And if people don't trust your government on a number of issues, then, of course, you gather a group and you come up with some type of extreme position and you identify an internal enemy, whether it's immigrants or people of a different religion or whatever. And that is fed also by the social media. When I saw the beginning of internet in the 80s and 90s, I saw that as a great democratization uh, factor. Yes, it is, of course. You know how much information you can get. Uh, but it's also turned out to be, I don't know, an instrument of extremists uh, and uh, where you also with the speed of information and with the speed of emotions translated uh, to millions of people, or at least th thousands of people, if you so like, and hate speech spreading and then causing uh, counter reactions, then you let loose something which uh, I don't think we can control. We have this discussion now, of course, and you are the ones to carry this on on artificial intelligence. So I become more skeptical about that. I, I, I notice in my family and my friends that I go back to the old virtues, <laughs> reading newspaper and, uh, and uh, having time for discussion and sitting down in a small group to try to find a formula for, for solving problems. In fact, this is really what diplomacy is about. No, you're right. Um, this mistrust is uh, is a poison in the uh, in the geopolitical situation now, but it's also poison in many societies, and that's why we we in our particular our democratic societies, we have to deliver. We have to deliver on uh, peace and justice. We have to de develop on equality between men and women. You have to develop on income distribution, we have to develop on freedom of speech, you know, you have to really show that democracy is the best type of system. If not, you people will look into solutions of different kinds. And especially if you don't have these rules well known. For instance, I, as a diplomat, find it shocking that people don't know what constitutes international law and international humanitarian law. For instance, in the war now in, in Israel, uh, between Israel and Hamas, there are breaches from both sides, serious breaches of international law. Uh, people don't even know that that is part of a, a system that we should know about. So I hope you, you're, you are learning and that they are being teaching international law to you at Cambridge and at Homerton. Yeah, um, of interest of time, one last question. We're here 
also with the Scandinavian Society of Cambridge, um, and you also already mentioned. I think Scandinavia is a bit of the wonderland of diplomacy. So uh, Raoul Wallenberg, Dag Hammarskjöld, uh, Olof Palm, and I mean, also beyond Sweden, Matti Atisari uh, and Ian Stoltenberg, these are all come from Scandinavia. What does make Scandinavia so special for diplomats? Is it the, uh, the what is Scandinavia's special position in international relations? What a nice question you ask me. <laughs> Well, I hope we can maintain that tradition that you mentioned. Uh, uh, it goes back to be uh, five rather small nations. Uh, we are the largest with 11 million now soon. Uh, Iceland is the smallest with 300,000 people. Uh, we are solidly uh, democratic, a democratic a democracy that is built from below, from labor unions, from... Uh, uh, organizations from uh, people's movements, you know, very strong uh, dem democracy based on 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 uh, popular support, and uh, fortunately also based on uh, solidarity. My father was a labor union leader, and uh, I grew up on that solidarity, and it was solidarity at home mostly. Uh, I come from a working class family. I was the first one to get uh, the education. And uh, it was a big struggle to bring about this equality and this uh, justice in our society. It came about in the 50s. Uh, Sweden and the Nordic countries were among the poorest countries in Europe back in the 30s, 20s and 30s. So it was a, a change that was rather drastic, but was based on good governance, I would say also, and, and certain principles of justice and equality. Um, and then we had two people who moved that solidarity concept to the international scene. Uh, the two most important people in that regard are Dag Hammarskjöld, the, the second uh, Secretary General of the UN, uh, who is really a bit of an icon for us uh, diplomats. Uh, he was a very effective uh, secretary general, and he, he was very principled, and he was very courageous. He died under mysterious circumstances in uh, northern Rhodesia at the time, now Zambia. Uh, and um, he took stands that were, as I said, very, very brave. The second person who uh, put a very strong brand as, and mark on Sweden's and Europe's uh, and the Nordic countries' policies was Olaf Palme. He, he was an activist prime minister, and he fought the Russian. He was very strong on on U.S. in Vietnam and on Russia in Afghanistan, and Soviet Union in Afghanistan, and so forth. He started a, a enormously generous uh, program of support for uh, developing countries. He gave active support to the liberation movements in uh, Africa. And he supported uh, the uh, the struggle against military dictatorships in Latin America. He became a global figure. And uh, I was working for him as a diplomat for six years. Uh, I was called in by him to help him in his mediation in the Iran-Iraq war. And when he died, he was assassinated in 1986. I took over the uh, mediation in Iran-Iraq and negotiated uh, the ceasefire in 1988, uh, partly at least I was playing part in that. Uh, so, so we had personalities that really put, uh, put that brand. And the Norwegians have done tremendously good work in mediation. Uh, they are rich, <laughs> the Norwegians, they have oil. So they have instituted an enormously uh, efficient uh, foreign service uh, and uh, service and training and mediation. And Finland has, of course, uh, Mati Ahtisari, the Nobel laureate, who died only two weeks ago, uh, who uh, played a very important role in the Aceh province, uh, province in Indonesia, and of course in Kosovo. And we have Swedish mediators, four or five of us, who have been involved, Hans Blix and Rolf Ikeus and other, and I myself, in several places. So this is a bit of a a specialty we have, but I must admit, and now I don't want to become too political, but we had a change of government in Sweden only a year ago. And um, the new government uh, is 
not as active in this regard, although they, of course, continue giving a substantial uh, development assistance, but cutting down on refugee reception and uh, and asylum seekers and and um, uh, cutting down some of the organizations that were supported by the social democratic government. But I hope that uh, these traditions are strong enough to survive and uh, the uh, activities of us together are still very, I would say, progressive and uh, and uh, meaningful. And I think we can also play an important role in, in a Europe that takes on a more global role. Uh, the, Nor the five Nordic countries will certainly support that because we don't play, I, in my view, a sufficiently strong global ro role in Europe. And that's why I come back to the point that we need you. Uh, it was a tremendous shock and loss to us with Brexit. Uh, we were almost depressed in uh, Swedish diplomacy. UK and Sweden were extremely close in uh, consultations on European Union policies. But I hope you we find some way of connecting more strongly in the future. Uh, I don't know whether you are on this line at all, but in that case, we count on your support. <laughs> we need you. And you may need us. Thank you. Uh, let's just open it up to the floor. Um, anyone want to ask a question? I'm wondering now that Sweden has applied for NATO membership, if this will make it harder for Swedish diplomats to play the mediating role that you did? That's a good question. Uh, I was uh, serving uh, with Olaf Palme and I was defending Swedish neutrality in all my life practically until Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. It took me about a month or two months to uh, mull this through and uh, come to the conclusion that we should uh, join NATO. We're still not in, by the way. The Turks and the Hungarians think that we are too strong on certain human rights issues, I think, basically. Uh, the Kurdish situation and the, uh, uh, the request for democracy in the case of Hungary. So they are not happy with us, although I hope they will in the end accept our application. But I, one of the reasons that I, I was uh, hesitant was exactly what is implied in your question. How will that affect our, our foreign policy and how, how will it affect our independence? And I must admit, of course, we will have more of coordination with NATO countries like we have now with European Union countries. But I look at my very close friends in Norway. Norway is a NATO member and Norway has really done a great job in mediation during this whole period when they, as NATO members, are active in those conflicts, whether it is in Colombia or in uh, Sri Lanka or whatever. Uh, they have even been more active than we are. Sweden is usually in the lead on these issues, but Norway uh, has really been uh, taking many, many initiatives. So they are a NATO member. So I hope that we will be able to do so. But I will also give you the reason why I in the end, swayed in the direction of membership. It was a combination of the horrible aggression uh, and the breach of the not only international law, but the European security order, first of all. And secondly, the, uh, the uh, brutality, the uh, complete disregard of civilians and the uh, complete disregard of international humanitarian law it was shocking to me to see such a war in Europe in these days when we were hoping for another future for our continent. And third reason was, of course, Finland, uh, who was always pressured by Soviet Union and Russia. They were actually taken from us. You know that Finland was part of Sweden for 600 years. We were like They were like a province in my country. And at 1809, the Russians uh, took it over. Uh, the Russians were there between 1809 and 1917. So their independence started only 1917. And uh, they were involved in the Second World in such a, war, such a way that Russia had an influence on, on their neutrality. So there were always the threats that Russia, uh, which is a neighbor to Finland, uh, would uh, exercise uh, a very negative influence, even the risk of a conflict that would affect uh, Russia and the Baltic countries, sorry, Finland and the Baltic countries. So my Finnish friends who are very close to me and uh, all diplomats in Sweden called us and said, we have to do this together. 
And we were convinced that, yes, if Finland goes for it, that was so important for us that we couldn't give a different alternative to show the Russians that we would still maintain a policy where they actually wanted to, when they actually wanted to develop a sphere of interest in our area. And the fourth reason was the democracy. It was a nowadays totalitarian state. I had bigger promises, bigger expectations on them earlier, but I don't hesitate to call them uh, totalitarian now. Uh, and they attacked the democracy. But democracy with deficiencies and problems, no doubt, yes, but still. And if that is done, it could be done to anyone. Ask the Baltic countries or Poland uh, or Finland. Uh, and uh, therefore, I said, uh, our collect we need more of a collective uh, defense. And we had unfortunately disarmed too much during the uh, Cold War and the after the uh, 1989 fall of the of the of the war. But I I hope that uh, the Swedes, the uh, the Nordics will will continue. And I think Norway sets a good example. And I try to spread the word as much as I can in Sweden, both uh, to the diplomats and to the universities. Um, yeah, without sort of too much crystal ball gazing, I'm, I'm sort of wondering, um, you've mentioned the climate crisis already, how, how would you see the sort of future of diplomacy and the future of conflict interacting with the climate crisis or in response to the climate crisis? <laughs> Well, I, I, I think you should try to go to, uh, try to be as practical as possible. And I want you, in case you're interested in, in uh, climate diplomacy, I think you should learn the 17 goals, sustainable development goals by heart. Because that is the recipe to reach the uh, 1.5 uh, degree uh, objective of Paris. If we actually live up to those SDGs, then we, we have something very concrete. Uh, the political problem is that the climate crisis is so big that people want to say, stop the world, I want to get off, or to turn off the television, I don't want to see it. And the skies look blue, don't they? And the sea looks blue. It doesn't look that critical, but it is critical. So I think you need to sort of be concrete and do work on a very hands-on basis. My passion from the goals, which I still work on, is water. I created a, a Swedish water aid. You have an excellent organization in the UK, in London. Water aid, one of the best uh, organizations. I established a similar organization in Sweden. And uh, I fought very hard for a water goal in the SDGs. So uh, I think take that practical approach. And then there is something else uh, that I think I, I count for my work. I can't. I can't understand why is the are the climate issues divisive in political life. In Sweden, it's put on a left-right scale, which to me is absurd, because the climate issues are and the environmental issues are universal and, and so overarching that they, in my view, should unite political parties. Uh, the conservatives should start to do language tracing. What does the word conservative come from? It comes from the word conserve, conservare in Latin, which means maintain and conserve nature, for instance. Uh, and it is also their children and their grandchildren which are staying. Uh, and so I don't understand why in the world where we need these uniting issues, these unifying issues, we continue to make it a left, right, left, right issue. Maybe it's the oil companies and the economic interests that are involved that are steering it in that direction still. But even the biggest companies in Sweden, uh, practically all of them now have very progressive uh, plans for, for instance, fossil-free steel and so forth. And no decent company here can come up with a primitive uh, program which leads to uh, emissions of CO2 uh, to a large degree that we have. Although we, it's, still, it's still not enough. But I think we, we need to have a uh, both a work on the political 
arena to to make this a unifying issue and then to use the uh, SEGs as a tool uh, to fight this helplessness in front of huge problems that I think is a human phenomenon. Maybe one last question or what do you think? Yes, I have dinner. My wife is... Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, then, we, then we don't want to treat you from I have two creatures looking at me right now. It is my wife and it's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> It's a white Labrador, five years old. His name is Leo, the lion. <laughs> he wants to have an evening walk in the Swedish late fall weather after I've had dinner, which is supposed to take place in 15 minutes. Okay. So, well, that's, yes, I can take one more question. One last, one last question. Who got a good? So you were talking about mistrust and the spread of mistrust in the, in the nations now. What do you think is the solution, if there is any, to build up trust again? And do you think the UN has a role to play in that? Well, you have to see it on so many levels. Um, I think if you start at home, uh, you need to make sure that democracy and our societies institutions work. I mentioned the word accountability. We are not good at accountability. We, we we don't check that we do things right. And we allow organized crime and uh, lots of horrible phenomena to, to grow to such a degree that people lose faith in institutions. So at the home, I think you need to fight it by proving the value of uh, democracy. I look back to my parents who were the champions of... Uh, Swedish democracy from below. You know, my father was, uh, as I said, a labor union leader, and he just hammered in. You know that my God, if you any corruption, get out of get out of the system, and and you have to be honest, and you have to do this and that, and order. <laughs> it was just a discipline, uh, and I think we have to prove that we we can deliver results and do it well at home. And then on the larger level, I'm very happy to see the Nordic countries. We 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 together are a very strong entity, and we are, I think, trustworthy and uh, still an entity that works and functions. The European Union has that, in my view, has picked up tremendously during the uh, Ukraine crisis. Uh, I'm surprised that the solidarity shown to Ukraine by uh, European European Union, with the small exception of the, I think, uh, Hungary and Slovakia now. But altogether, I think European Union has proven that we stand for values. And that's why I have hope that European Union should also become more of a global actor. And that we understand that the most important word in the world today is the word together. That's the most important word. And that's why, of course, I as a uh, as a basic optimist uh, still believe that uh, the UN and what UN stands for must be revived. We are down now, it's an uphill battle, but I think the values uh, given in this uh, in this charter that I always have around are so important that we uh, we have to, when I was Deputy Secretary, I had a wonderful staff, you know, my office with the most uh, smartest and intelligent and active uh, young people. And when they were depressed about the Syria war at the time, mostly, I said to them, remember, United Nations is a reflection of two things. Uh, United Nations is a reflection of the uh, a mirror of the world as it is. And right now at the time, and also today even more, it's not a pretty place. And you have to know what the world is now. Don't put on any rosy glasses. You have to be realistic and do the most sober analysis of what's going on. But remember, UN is also a mirror of the world as it should be. And you have to always keep in mind both perspectives, the world as it is, not a pretty place, and the world as it should be, UN Charter and living together in peace and development of human rights. If you forget the world as it should be, you don't know where to go. 
you have no compass, you have no direction. So you always have to keep in mind the world as it should be, even when you live under the most dangerous and dirtiest and horrible circumstances. And the meaning of UN, I was about to say the meaning of life, but the <laughs> meaning of, <laughs> that's too much, is to actually, during this time we are around on this earth, is to reduce the gap between the world as it is and the world as it should be. One millimeter, one centimeter, half a meter, or whatever. Nobody can do everything but everybody can do something. So that's where I stand on trust. Uh, we, we simply have to build it and we have to realize that we have a responsibility. We should accept to accept that responsibility and we shouldn't run away from responsibility. Don't, this, these blame games go, that go on are terrible. We all have a role and uh, you have a role. You have a much more important role than I have. My job is to hand over the baton in this race to another relay, <laughs> another team running the race, which you probably should do with your background at Omaton and Cambridge. What a start you have in life. Thank you for these, I mean, amazing final words. Uh, thank you much for, for giving us these insights. I think that was a real pleasure for all of us. Um, would, you, would you join us in the cafe? Thank you. I'm sorry about my book, but I think the, the book is called uh, in Swedish Ord och handling ett liv i diplomatins tjänst. Word and action. A life in the world of diplomacy. And uh, some chapters there uh, I think are of interest to you. Particularly the one on mediation and negotiation. But um, you can look through the, uh, if you get it on the website or whatever, uh, there are translations of uh, chapters. And Google have done a pretty good job with some of these chapters. So uh, if you are interested in my thinking and uh, more of the details of the issues, uh, look at that book or try to learn Swedish. <laughs> Okay. But thank you very much and good luck to you all. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.